and welcome to this third uh, mini class on the Hepatica Week. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a uh, series of presentations today. But before I present you the uh, to the speakers, I will just remind you to uh, a, a few words, say a few words about the uh, the Hepatica Week. It's a week dedicated to uh, my favorite flower, the spring flower, live a leaf, which has the uh, the Latin name Hepatica nubilis. At least that's one of the names. So that's why we have Hepatica Week, and we are covering uh, the uh, collection of observation of this flower from the forest. In this case, I have been showing you a lot of uh, visuals from the Norwegian forest where we make an observation, and then all the way. Uh, through some transformations to the actual use of the data. And uh, one of the things that is very useful with this particular flower is that it's a very strong indicator of spring. And that's important when the spring, spring starts, that's important for climate change research, for instance. So this week we have then several live broadcasts from the Norwegian forest with uh, Periscope. And then we have this series of uh, uh, mini classes where we go a little bit more into depth on the different topics uh, of the aspects of collecting citizen data or citizens' observations, which we in fact then do with our mobile phones. And earlier this week, you were introduced to a mobile app called My Seasons, and you can watch the uh, the presentations uh, done on Monday to more details about that. Yesterday, we learned a whole lot more about the flower, the liver leaf, or Leberblümchen in German, Blauweiss in Norwegian. There we, we revealed uh, hepatica secrets yesterday. And we also were introduced to a new, a little bit more complex mobile application. And today, we will talk more about mobile applications and we will talk more about the specific use of, uh, of mobile applications uh, in the sense that in the sense of gamification or games and you will learn more about the, the uh, different uh, nuances in that and then finally we will travel with our flower our observations all the way from the Norwegian forest into a global database so uh, before we start, then I would like then to introduce you to the panel of speakers, and um, I'll, we will start with the first one. Eric, can you present yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Eric. I live in uh, Oslo, Norway, and I'm uh, currently a student at the University of Oslo, where I'm uh, working on my master's uh, thesis. Hello, Eric. We are really looking forward to. Uh, mobile applications uh, tools there, and then um, <laughs> and then uh, good night. What are you going to talk about, and who are you? <laughs> My name is Gunnar Evin uh, uh, I'm a freelance consultant working with uh, Gamified Services. Uh, I've already been through the masters at the University of Oslo uh, within the same topic, gamification and collaboration, and I am to be talking a little bit about uh, mobile applications and uh, the introduction of uh, gamification or gamified services, if you will. Oh, thank you. Awesome. And then finally, you will take us on a journey, Doug. Yes, I'm uh, Doug in Dresden. I will talk and show more about the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I'm the representative in Norway. And as I will show, there is representatives in many countries. I'm also based in the University of Oslo. Great. I'm so excited. Um, we will learn a lot today. And uh, in fact, we are, so we are having three presentations. And uh, after each of the presentations, you will be able to ask questions. So uh, please do post pic uh, questions in the chat box. And we will try to answer them as they come, or at the very end of the uh, uh, the mini class, we will also answer some questions. So then, I think we can start with uh, mobile app tools. Eric, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. 
today I'm going to talk a bit about my uh, thesis with the working title uh, Framework for Citizen Science and Crowdsourcing, Mobile Applications and Services. So if you just give me a second to bring up my presentation. Is it up and running? All right. The area of citizen science and crowdsourcing of observation data is currently being focused by many projects and activities, both in Norway and internationally. It seems that many of the current approaches are similar and that it would be beneficial to consider the creation of a framework or toolkit which could be a foundation for application in multiple future projects. I'm going to demonstrate this potential by briefly describing three seemingly different mobile apps by showing that they're not that different after all. The first application is City Air. City Air is developed by Nilu, Norwegian Institute for Air Research. It was developed for an ongoing EU project called CitySense. City Air will allow you to report on how you perceive the air quality where you are. This information will help to create a citizen's air quality map, which is viewable in the app. Its source of data is GPS coordinates and user input. This app is available on both Apple App Store and Google Play Store. The second application I want to describe is the My Seasons app. If you watched the webinar yesterday, uh, on Monday actually, or some of the Periscope sessions, this app should be familiar. My Seasons is an application developed by the Department for Earth Observation of the Friedrich Schiller University, China, in Germany. The app lets you analyze the start, length, and end of the growing season, and long-term vegetation analysis made available from an archive of satellite data on environmental changes. Users can collect data with the app and compare their individual observation with satellite measurements. The data is collected by using GPS, camera, and optional contact information. This app is also available on Apple's App Store and Google Play Store. The third and last application I'm going to show you is SunSense. This application is not yet developed, but it will be soon. SunSense is a Norwegian startup company which have developed a wearable UV sensor. The UV sensor keeps track of how much UV radiation your skin is exposed to during the day. The second version of their sensor is a Bluetooth-enabled sensor, which will communicate with the SunSense app. The app will gather data from the sensor, show it to the user, and store it in a database for later use. So we have these three different apps, City Air, My Seasons, and SunSense. If we generalize and take a look at the different components, we see that City Air has a base app. It has a user interface with some views, it has some sources of input to our data, and it has a storage for the collected data. If we now do the same with My Seasons and SunSense, we see that they use many of the same components. So our goal is to make a toolkit where the toolkit provides the underlying structure with app, use, and data store, and a repository of sensor input modules that can easily be implemented. So why create a toolkit? We hope that my thesis will answer that question, but initially we think these are some of the main benefits of using a toolkit for your next citizen science application. Supplement to using mockups and cheaper and faster to develop version 0.x. By using this toolkit, you will be able to have a first version up and running in a matter of days instead of months. It could, it could then supplement or replace the use of mockups in demonstration settings. Support of Lean Startup. One of the main principles in Lean Startup is to develop a minimum viable product, that is, having a version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. By using the toolkit, you can have a minimum viable product quickly to the market and do continuous deployment based on user feedback. 
eventually replacing the app built with the toolkit with your own native application. Choosing the best storage solution. Choosing the best storage, storage solution is not trivial. When talking about sensor data, depending on the sensor and the application, we could easily be talking about millions of records stored in some kind of database. If you're not using the best suited database for your sensor data, you might see queries taking minutes instead of seconds. One of my fellow students at the university is writing a master's thesis on benchmarking of different storage solutions for different types of sensor data. By taking advantage of his findings, we, could be we would be able to recommend the best storage solution for your type of sensor data. As I've just started my thesis work, this toolkit is not yet developed, but we aim to have some kind of working framework this fall. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you want to hear more about this project or have any kind of input. Thank you for your time. I think you're still uh, muted, Benta. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me uh, about being muted. So that was really very interesting, uh, Eric, to hear about this tool. It sounds to me, as somebody who is just learning to use these apps for citizen science, that there might be many different uh, niches within citizen science uh, that could uh, benefit from a very specific uh, mobile application. So what you are saying is that it could be easy to create such a new mobile application, right? To very tailored to a specific, answering a specific question. That's exactly what we hope to achieve by creating this toolkit. Excellent, excellent. Um, then we will go into another aspect of a mobile application, uh, Gunnar, and talk about gaming. Okay. <sighs> I'll just uh, flip straight over to the presentation screen here. And then back again. There we go. Uh, introduction to gamified services. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a few different topics. First of all, I'm going to touch on why you would want to gamify in the first place. And uh, I'm going to quickly pass through uh, a few definitions because uh, there are starting to gather up quite a few of them. Uh, I'm going to touch on a topic called the magic circle. And the reason I'm doing this is uh, because of the understanding of uh, the combination of games and services when you do science or you create uh, citizen science uh, applications. You are uh, merging them with the game, uh, if this is the kind of game uh, experience that you're uh, aiming for. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, mobile gaming experience challenges and solutions. There are a few basics uh, involved that you need to consider from the beginning and uh, that are easy to address right away. And uh, uh, in the end, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some uh, uh, possibilities out there, which I'm hoping that somebody will be able to make use of. Um, the why is actually very simple. Uh, when I was doing my master's thesis, I was looking a lot about, uh, looking a lot into gamification, and I tried to figure out uh, how many gamers there were out there. And I found this little piece. Uh, if we have our population at 7 billion, we have an online population at about 3. And of those, two of them a little bit less are gamers, meaning that the potential customer base that you have to work towards is huge, much larger than at least I anticipated when I started my thesis, and I'm still quite impressed by the number. Um, when we look at the definitions of uh, gaming, it's, it's quite easy to uh, uh, hop one step back and talk about play, uh, which is basically what our kids do. They don't work with any rules. They play really freely. And it's by adding these rules that it tends to turn into a game, uh, as well as structure, for that matter. Uh, 
hide and seek being a good example. Uh, Monopoly would be a natural next step for most families. And uh, if you're an online gamer, World of Warcraft is uh, also a dead given. Now, um, if we move one step further, uh, we have the buzzword of gamification, which has also become uh, quite popular. And uh, it involves adding game com components to a service, meaning that we're not talking about a game. We're talking about a service that has something gamish added to it. Uh, good examples would be uh, Microsoft language uh, quality uh, application, which uh, involved local offices uh, in a competition uh, where they would increase the language quality of Microsoft applications by uh, having them read through and translate or uh, comment on translations that Microsoft were doing. And another one would be the Google travel expenses, uh, where the employees were able to choose what to do with unused travel allowances. And they could choose to have it on their own paycheck, they could save it for the next trip, or they could give it to charity. And the intention was, of course, to have uh, more people being effective in delivering their uh, travel uh, expense uh, documentation. And the results were immense, 100% compliance. Now, uh, gamification in general, uh, per today, uh, focuses on areas like innovation. You have a location-based and other types of social networking. There is uh, commerce and customer relations, customer loyalty. There's also uh, elements of education, self-development programs, coaching, uh, employee performance, you name it. It's been used all over. Now, of these, specifically at least, uh, education and data gathering, uh, they are more and more moving beyond gamification and into what we, or I at least, like to call a complete gamified service. And this is when we're not really talking about a purely service anymore, because it's also a complete game. Uh, these are, per today, usually referred to as serious games or edu games or simulations. Uh, the Introduction here I would like to make is, a, is an application called The World Without Oil. It's like a think tank scenario simulating the first 32 weeks of a global oil crisis um, where the users then are faced with challenges and try to figure out uh, uh, solutions as to how to deal with uh, uh, this crisis. There is Foldit, which is a protein folding game famous for Soviet uh, solving an HIV enzyme puzzle within three weeks, which the scientists have spent 10 years trying to solve. Uh, you have a simulation called US Army, which is a first-person shoot-them-up game, which you will often see kids running around with their consoles and blowing each other up on the TV screen, uh, which is also a recruitment game for the US Army. And finally, and one of the newer ones, is uh, something called Project Discovery which is an integrated game into an MMO platform from EVE Online, which uh, aims to categorize protein patterns. So that gives you a little bit of the perspectives of the differences. And as you can see, most of these uh, trends are moving into the direction where you want to complete a more complete gamified exp or game experience rather than cutting it short. <coughs> now, um, Experience design. This is a game experience that we're talking about. And uh, when you do experience design, you are designing for a, a change, uh, an experience that you have. It starts somewhere and then it ends somewhere. And at the beginning, when you start it out, you are stepping into what is sometimes referred to as a magic circle. This is a gaming terminology which uh, describes the border between a game world and a real world or you could say an arena for playing. It's uh, uh, th the point where you stop working with the reality's rules and you are influenced or dominated by the rules of the game. Uh, per today, most of the time, this is a conscious choice uh, and we have a common understanding of what these rules are. 
uh, especially if we're playing together with somebody else. You don't want uh, the other person to start making their own rules. For example, in Monopoly, you don't want somebody to start stealing cash from the bank. Um, at work, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, 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 you're not going to start playing hide-and-seek with your boss. So the magic circle for hide-and-seek usually does not happen randomly at work. And uh, you don't get $200 for leaving your home in the morning, um, which would have been really nice, but uh, again, leaving home for work in the morning is not Monopoly. And of course, luckily for us, unlike World of Warcraft, there is no maximum level that we can reach as human beings. Uh, we can progress as far as we want. And for most situations that go beyond what we commonly refer to as games, uh, we find both a game and a service. Or in the case of citizen science, it is usually a science research project or application. And if you are using gamified uh, solutions, they are connected or even merged. Now, <clears throat> there are many ways of uh, combining these two. Uh, the most common, uh, which Folded might be an experience uh, of, and the world with oil as well, is pure di data harvesting, where you create the game and, and basically feeds uh, data into a, a database of sorts. And um, um, the basic game concept is built so that this uh, data has value to the stakeholders. And uh, if you start merging the service and the game, which is example two here, uh, only parts of the game will be available. So basically, a service borrows certain game components from some one or more other games, which is usually what we uh, refer to as gamification or gameful experience in this case. Um, you could put a game inside a service. Uh, the Microsoft language quality game uh, could be considered such a game. Uh, it was introduced into a, a quality assurance service and a, a translation uh, project that Microsoft was running. Uh, it could easily uh, work without this game component, but the game component enhanced it and made it more fun. And as such, you got your employees more involved. Um, you can have a service within a game. For most people who do play games, the simplest way of explaining this is game support. Basically, when something goes wrong in your game, uh, you want to yell at somebody because it's not working as you want it to. And most online games, at least, they introduce a support uh, part uh, or a support service to their game. Uh, and each of these components, the game and the support service, they can, of course, work on their own, but when they are merged, they become stronger. Of course, getting help when you are in the game and having it dealt with there and then makes your experience much better. And finally, uh, the last example, number five here, is a sort of simulation or a visual presentation of EVE online project Discover which is a serious game. That's a little green one inside a big game. And um, it feeds data into uh, a research project in, in Sweden and in Iceland. And each of these can work on their own. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be combined like this. But when they are, it enhances all of them. So why are these models important? Well. Most mobile game services today, they are defined and limited by the choice of model, this kind of model, uh, as to what game components and functions that are available to you. And it's a very simple way uh, to create like a very quick mental picture of how you want your gamified service to work. And it's an excellent place to begin a design process. Having this understanding also gives you a little bit uh, uh, of an idea of how much development work you are looking at. So, we move on to the mobile game experience. So, how much time your game requires and how often you need to log on to enjoy the game. These are both issues that pop into mobile game experiences and not necessarily to other games. At least not in this extent. Uh, 
if you are looking at a time frame, uh, whether or not you have a couple of seconds before stepping onto the subway, or maybe you have a couple of minutes uh, while you're sitting there uh, on your way to work, or maybe you're in the lunch break and you actually have some uh, uh, additional time because nobody wants to talk to you. <coughs> and you can quarter yourself up and play around with your new gamified application. And uh, all of these different time perspectives uh, require different game activities. So the one second one usually won't take you very much time. So we're talking about pushing a button at the maximum. Otherwise, you're spending usually more time than a couple of seconds. If you have a couple of minutes, you can add a couple of uh, elements. And if you're talking about hours, you can integrate more complex patterns of interactions. You can actually demand a lot more of your users when they're there. Now, uh, at the same time, each of these will require certain uh, interactions. Now, uh, like I said, the, the real-time uh, short interactions uh, you don't have any time to type, and they require as few interaction options as possible. Whereas when you have several hours, and you, this is something that you need uh, to do uh, maybe on a weekly basis, uh, it is likely to include multiple number of the interactions and combinations of such. You're investing a lot more time in, in an application like this. And uh, that moves us on to ownership. Because the moment you're going to start spending this much time with an application, ownership is one of the things that promotes loyalty. And interaction that influence ownership, they add value to such a gamified experience. Because a mobile uh, gamified service is part of my phone. And the phone is mine. And uh, I own the apps on it. And as such, if I'm going to do something with one of those apps, I also feel a direct ownership to that. So if you're going to take this away from the users, or you're going to leave them with no ownership at all, well, they don't have the same reason to come back or invest more time in it. And uh, for many game experiences, this uh, involves uh, creating things like a user profile, or you can add virtual commodities, uh, or rewards. Uh, in this case, both intrinsic and extrinsic ones are in use. Intrinsic meaning uh, the ones uh, where you uh, are happy because you did something, and the extrinsic when you, you actually get uh, a physical reward to hold in your hand. So, and finally, the issue of critical mass. It doesn't matter how good your platform is or how awesome your science application is unless you have a certain number of users the loyal core of your active gamers in my situation, because we're talking about the games. You want your users to communicate and connect and cooperate. I mean, the first question you ask yourself when you enter into an application like this is if you're the only one using the service. And if there are more, how can I find them? How can I interact with them? Uh, can we do things together? And uh, as a designer and a stakeholder, you want to connect your users uh, to generate this loyal core group of users. And you can, of course, use cooperation, which is the easiest way to get people to work together. Uh, but also competition uh, can add a certain uh, spice into, uh, uh, into motivating users this way. Uh, keep in mind that competition often creates winners and losers, and your losers might not be uh, equally motivated to continue playing afterwards. At least uh, I have some friends that are very sore losers, and they would most likely not appreciate uh, playing something where they lost. To uh, uh, give some examples a little bit uh, on the outside here, these are considered a little bit in between uh, geocaching kind of games or gamification kind of games. But the interesting part with all of these is that they have the potential of working for citizen science projects as well. Um, Ingress is a massive multiplayer online geocaching game. And they are highly mobile, and they have extremely loyal core users. A good example uh, I have from a friend of mine uh, in which they had a game node appearing up at Svalbard. 
and uh, they needed to get somebody up there right away to capture this note as part of you know the the game experience and there are two teams on this game so they had to do it before the other team now the players on their team they went in and they uh, pitched in to finance this trip for one of their fellow players as long as this fellow player dropped everything and went to Svalbard now if uh, you in a citizen science project would be able to get anybody to travel around the world like this uh, at a very short notice and it didn't cost anything that of course would be something which I don't think would be possible today with any of the present citizen science projects but here you have a game and they're even paying for the game second one uh, is something called zombie run which is also a very uh, half famous uh, exercise application exists on both iPhone and Android if you want to try it out uh, the difference this one has is uh, in addition to the game point, uh, uh, component it also has a narrative there's a story to tell and for most citizen science projects there is a story to tell and there is information to share but of course the importance when you are creating a, a gamified experience like this you have to make it personal uh, general information is not as interesting as something which is directed specifically as the person that you are sending it to and finally something called resources sometimes uh, the virtual treasure hunting from uh, games like geocaching which is also another big one where you run around hunting for treasures that people have hidden around the, in, the, in your neighborhood virtual treasure hunting is of course an option you don't need any treasures at all uh, you're basically uh, doing the same as geocaching but without the physical uh, object uh, which actually uh, create a higher level of user initiative than uh, in a game where everything is all virtual and it's an em economically um, uh, focused MMO experience and uh, uh, creating virtual experiences like this uh, can have uh, your users go out and invest and play with elements that are not really there combining uh, real world uh, elements with fictional ones is a very interesting and new way of doing things and most of the uh, winning applications such as Foldit uh, or the EVE Online Project Discovery are doing exactly that they are combining the two and finally uh, made a little list uh, this presentation will be available to everybody afterwards uh, it will be able to send you to uh, some of the, the games uh, and show you what they are about and you can try out if you want and that about sums it up for me I hope to see many gamified citizen science projects in the time to come that makes things a lot more fun and uh, it would uh, make it a lot easier for me to trick my three-year-old daughter into participating. Uh, thank you so much uh, Gunnar and I think now with the two presentations there shouldn't be any doubt that the potential of uh, uh, gathering lots and lots of Earth observations uh, by citizens is enormous and which then uh, transform us over to or <laughs> uh, to a dog who is go who is going to take care of all this data and how are we handling all the data and we are starting with a global database that we will learn more about uh, right now and dog I just uh, I jump directly to you as we are uh, uh, over the half hour already so dog please let us know where the data you know, and observations of the liver leaf, where can it go? Yep, yeah, I'll start the screen share. Um, now it should be on. Um, this is um, a platform where a lot of these different citizen science projects can publish the data and make it available for, for research, as I will show. Um, to do that, you need to convert the data records uh, from these uh, citizen science reports into a format we call Darwin Core. 
it's a specified uh, terminology. And it's uh, good to make some quality assessment of the records to ensure the location and the scientific names of the species. And then you can go on and publish it in GBIF. And we will bring it on further to make it accessible to scientists. As I will show some examples of. So GBIF is a global uh, facility that enables free and open access to biodiversity data of all kinds um, online. Um, we have a steep increase in uh, data records. The only last month we had an increase of 4 million uh, records, uh, some 300 uh, data sets and uh, six more institutes uh, signing up. Um, it's composed of countries uh, with direct membership uh, and they fund a national uh, node like, like I am representing Norway in this. Uh, to facilitate uh, publishing this data online. And uh, the bigger um, participants, the bigger countries in this uh, are shown here. The uh, United States is uh, very large, Sweden is very large, Norway is in the top 10 at least, so we are also contributing quite a bit of data. This is the data published from Norwegian institutes into the network uh, uh, from a uh, total, uh, from a uh, 32 different countries about Norway, uh, sorry. Um, and then I will talk a bit about uh, the infrastructure that we deliver. Uh, GBIF aimed to be the, the pipeline where all this data flows. So you hook on your data into this uh, network and then the different initiatives can pull the data out through this pipeline. So it's um, a discovery system where, where different uh, initiatives can pull out more data than what we index in the um, portal that we uh, offer. Uh, this is done through a format we call Darwin Core and Darwin Core Archives, and it's possible to pull out much more than what we index and provide from the GBIP portal. And this is some examples. Uh, a research Institute published uh, data sets uh, onto this platform. And different purposes can pull out richer, broader, uh, more detailed data than, than we have from our infrastructure. But anyway, we, we make this um, joint infrastructure and uh, we partner up with a lot of global initiatives, including the GEOS, where, where GBIF is a um, partner of this EU bond and the GEO bond uh, in, in GEOS and, and provide this biodiversity. Uh, data component of it. Um, very, very quickly about Darwin Core. It's uh, the preferred data exchange uh, standard that we use on the individual records. There are some other alternatives, but this is the most widely used and uh, the one we recommend. It's uh, basically it's a bag of, of terms, a bag of, of uh, labels on, on concepts that we uh, can share. So you should follow the definition of this term and, and use this name when you share your data. And then we package it together in the zip file and that's the format that we transport the data uh, around. And you can package in there much more details than uh, what we care about in the GB portal. So you can include like phenology uh, for, for the uh, blue flowers, hepatitis. Um, and then quickly about how you can then approach GBIF to actually uh, publish your data. The first step um, would be to, to seek an endorsement. Normally, uh, who publish in GBIF are research institu institutions, museums, uh, collections of material. Um, I will mention a bit about citizen science platforms in the next slide. Uh, but the first step for anybody is to seek an endorsement. And then that one is uh, normally picked up by one of the country nodes, the country participants. And then you have to work a bit with your data to convert it into this Darwin Core format I mentioned. And then we can help you uh, with the actual publishing. You can give it to the national node or also in Copenhagen, we can help you to facil facilitate the actual publication of this data. Um, a number of citizen science uh, platforms are publishing through uh, GBIF. Um, I just started to collect some examples. We have Art Portal and Arch Observation in Sweden and Norway, publishing a, num a solid number of records. 
um, e-bird, iNaturalist, Divebird, Animals from Germany. There's a lot of, of these kind of platforms uh, publishing in GBIF already. Some uh, are seeking uh, individual endorsement and some are publishing from the national node or from a hosting institute. So if uh, an, um, a citizen science project like My Seasons wants to seek endorsement, you go to data in the vvvgbif.org uh, portal and you find publishing data and you seek the tab uh, request endorsement and uh, proceed from the blue button. Um, just uh, very quickly to show how iNaturalist is doing this uh, quality assessment. Um, I dropped some uh, records in iNaturalist and uh, some of them reach so-called uh, research grade and that means that they are shared with GBIF. The other records uh, will then uh, be pending. So they have a system where they grade in the, uh, these citizen science reports into research grade, uh, something that needs an IT that can become a research grade, or casual. To be able to reach research grade, you have to have a photo or some kind of media. You need coordinates, a date, uh, there's some uh, additional quality metrics, and there must be a community uh, agreement on the taxon ID. Um, then quickly how you can uh, download the data from, from GBIF. This will be the, uh, the set of, of attributes that we index. And you can uh, access much more if you take the Darwin Co archives directly. You start by uh, exploring occurrences, uh, by species, by data set, by country, or, or, or different entry points. Uh, if you go in and search for species, uh, you type in uh, the English name or the, Latin, uh, the scientific name, Apatica nobilis, for example, and you get uh, some hits. And then you select the species you were searching for, and oops, and you get to um, um, a page where we collect the types of information we have about it. It can be just uh, name uh, data, or it can be with occurrences, with locations. And then you go on to view them and download them, and you can use them uh, uh, for, for these purposes. We also have a very uh, powerful uh, API where you can access the data using web services. For example, this is used by uh, different R packages, and I will just highlight how easy it is with, with one of these, the RGB from our open site. So with these few lines, that's all you need to create this map. You make a map of the of the of the Hepatica nobilis, and that's uh, in in R. You should try it out. You will find the the presentation afterwards. Um, and then quickly to s uh, sum up, um, data is increasingly being used in research. You will see this trend that more and more uh, research papers that we are mapping are are citing uh, data sets published through GBIF. And 2.16 is only starting, so we expect the bar to uh, go beyond uh, the other years. So that was uh, a quick summary of GBIF, and this is the people that work with GBIF in Norway. And there are, of course, similar teams in, in other member countries. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pe. That was really interesting. And uh, you might not know this, but I am actually been a part of the uh, group of Earth observation uh, community since uh, almost the beginning in 2004 and I I know how difficult it is to to make the data interoperable and what you do in GBIF is is an enormous enormous job so that was very interesting to hear um, let me see if there are any questions I definitely have some questions um, and one of the, th I mean, what we have been dis talking about today is then uh, that there is uh, a possibility to create even more technology, in this case, mobile applications. Uh, also, a little bit, you showed um, the PC, the Arch uh, Data Banking is, is really a online tool rather than a mobile tool. Uh, and then you, we, we saw how gamification, gamification has really a great potential to, uh, to inspire more use. So 
even more data that was already very overwhelming, I have to say, Doug, <laughs> that you had collected. Um, so there will be there will be bigger challenges for you. Are you prepared to handle like big data? Is that an issue in in GBIF? The data volume is uh, quite uh, massive, so we have this hard up and so on. We scale up and use these big data database tools to be able to uh, to index and, and bring this data together. And we are looking for services that you can play off and. Uh, and of course, there, there are these uh, Galaxy uh, Taverna services you can run on this data storage, so it's in the cards. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't say much about it, but there are. No, it, it, it's just something you makes you think after hearing all you know the three presentations now make me think that well, there's a great potential here. Eric is going to make it even easier to create uh, mobile apps. And uh, Gunnar, he's explaining, you know, he's giving us ideas on how we can get even more people to play with those apps. So <laughs> there will be a, a great flood of data potentially. But I just, uh, th these data that you have in GBIF, those are free and open. Or do you have to pay for it or any limitations for no. using the data? There is a requirement for joining GBIF that you have to provide a C, uh, Creative Commons. Uh, at maximum, you can limit no commercial uh, uh, work based on the data, but most of it um, uh, is available by CC BY. And uh, we also encourage CC0, so public domain publication, but most of it is CC BY, so you have to cite like a good scientist. Right, so that's the type of licenses that, that you mentioned there, the uh, acronyms. And stronger, uh, more restrictive licenses is not allowed. No, right. So, the and what else did I? Um, I made some noise uh, notes here. Um, when it comes to, I mean, Eric and perhaps also Gunnar, uh, you were you were mentioning business aspects of uh, mobile application and gamification. Now that is slightly different than what we were talking about now, um, having the data free and open. Is this uh, an issue that is uh, included or discussed uh, in your work? Um, we haven't uh, discussed that particular uh, theme very much, but the data itself you, you might monetize on your app without closing down the data. Uh, so I think there's still a potential to earn money be a successful startup without uh, putting any constraints on the data. Um, yes, and uh, Gunnar? Uh... It's an excellent answer. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, it's, it's, it's the designing of these applications. Uh, in most cases, that's going to be difficult. Uh, or in my case also, I, I believe that uh, there's a huge potential in, in uh, uh, cooperating with uh, some of the big games that are already out there and make use of their active user, uh, 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 their core loyal user database as well. Um, and of course, this combination puts a marketing value in there right away, but the whole idea is to generate data which should be commonly available. Uh, and ownership on the data, that would be problematic in the first place because then you also move on to uh, individual ownership of the data, uh, which would also uh, generate uh, even more jurisdictional hazards for most. So keeping an open source, at least on the data gathered, seems to be uh, a necessity. Right, yeah, so what I, I think we can take home for today is that uh, GBIF has really made it very easy for all those who are now inspired to make more mobile applications, even with a gamified uh, functionality, to just go straight to the GBIF website and with a couple of clicks you will be able to deliver data to, uh, to GBIF. Is that right, Doug? Did I understand it correctly? Yeah, that's the objective. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's all set up for uh, for lots and lots of observations of the lovely spring flower, which is sort of the uh, 
the uh, test case uh, that we are talking about, you know, where we are talking about the data management around. Basically, that's what we are doing. So, do you have any other other comments or questions to each other? By the way. No, I think we then can close up uh, this uh, mini class, which lasted a little bit longer than uh, we anticipated. But I hope that you got a lot out of it. Uh, I certainly did personally. So thank you so much, Dog, Eric, and Gunnar. That was great to learn uh, what you are something about what you are doing right now. It's really, I, I, I do actually call it state of the art what you are doing. Uh, it's, uh, it's very fascinating the, the way we are pushing the technology to help nature. And um, before we leave, I just want to inform you about tomorrow's program. We have each day, we have a mini class this Hepatica week. And I I think I will remind you about tomorrow's program because tomorrow we will continue to talk about what happens to our observations about uh, the uh, Hepatica nobilis or the liver leaf or Leberblümchen or Blauweiss. And uh, I will share a screen with you where I have the uh, program for tomorrow. Just hold on. That was the wrong one, or no? I can use that. You see the, you see this is the uh, program for tomorrow. Uh, we are going to talk more specifically about the transformation of our observation of the flower, and make it into actual scientific data. So data that can be used in science, and. Uh, I believe uh, Nils uh, Dog is part of your team in GBIF as well, but he will talk more specifically how the species observation reporting system works here in Norway. And then we will go also into the quality assurance and validation uh, processes because the quality, knowing the quality of the data, I would say, is really important and is very pivotal to that knowledge is pivotal to the way we are using the data. And then finally also the importance of metadata, so that will be data around our observation, uh, meta, uh, data about the data and the use of standards. You heard now that the, there are so many ways of creating a, uh, a uh, mobile application and there are so many ways to you know there are so many standards so many solutions so standardization is is also key in order for us to be able to combine our observations say if we observe the uh, liver leaf in Japan and in one in uh, America and then one in Norway uh, is it done the same way do we use the same name or questions like that will be answered tomorrow. So I hope to see you then. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, sign up and follow follow us on um, hashtag Hepatica Week for more information uh, and, uh, and let us hear what you wonder about. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you the panel and uh, have a good day. Okay. Focus. Talk to you later. Very good. You are not live. No.